Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Thanks for joining. We are very excited to bring you some more information on this really critical topic. Um, my name is Caitlin Bergstrom. I'll be doing some of our moderating and chat Q&A today. I work with the American Geophysical Union, AGU. Um, AGU and the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund have been partnering together for nearly a decade on issues like uh, scientific freedom and the rights of scientists. Um, and AGU and the Government Accountability Project have been working together for the last four years on things like scientific integrity defense. Um, and Dana and I were, were talking over email that we're very excited to be working on the offensive end of this and giving, giving all our scientists some great tools to work in science policy and make sure that um, we're getting all the great science information out there. So first, uh, we are going to go to um, Augusta Wilson with CSLDF to um, to start, as folks have questions throughout the session, um, please go ahead and drop those in the question box. We're going to have some time at the end to go through them, and we're going to answer questions that folks submitted with their registration um, during the Q&A as well. So, Augusta, go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, as she just mentioned, I am an attorney with Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, um, and I'm really glad to be with you here today. Um, so we just had this transition from a presidential administration in which the sidelining of science and attacks on its norms were so ubiquitous, it felt impossible to keep up, to an administration that clearly wants to rebuild our scientific capacity. And this is really great news, and it creates a moment of huge opportunity for scientists and science communicators to think about how to create a more resilient culture of scientific integrity in our federal agencies and other important research institutions. So I'm going to start us off today by talking about one important tool for addressing threats to scientific integrity which is scientific integrity policies. Um, many institutions where scientific research happens have some form or other of scientific integrity policy in place. And this notably includes essentially all of the federal scientific agencies, but also to some degree universities and even some state agencies. Uh, and turning to this first slide here, uh, when most people think of scientific integrity violations, what they think of is research misconduct. Um, that sort of typical definition, uh, fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism uh, of data or in the proposing uh, or reporting of research, um, not including honest error or differences of opinion. That's sort of the traditional uh, definition of research misconduct and what most people think of when they think of scientific integrity, I think. Um, and preventing that kind of misconduct is obviously crucial to any institution's ability to ground itself in sound high quality science. And it's rightfully at the core of essentially every scientific integrity policy I've ever seen. Um, in fact, universities in the US generally don't have scientific integrity policies per se, but they have widely adopted research misconduct policies or you know, something similar that cover fabrication or falsification of data and plagiarism. But I think we've all come to appreciate that scientific integrity is much broader than research misconduct. It requires honesty and transparency and objectivity, not only in the conducting of scientific research, but in communicating about it that go far beyond avoiding just fudging the numbers or plagiarizing. Um, and what I want to do is highlight a few areas that many federal agency scientific integrity policies already cover that are equally crucial to ensuring that these institutions conduct sound science. Um, all of them are, I'll note, areas that most universities' policies don't yet actually address at all. Um, that said, if you are a scientist who is not a federal employee, um, don't tune out, um, because in many cases, agencies' scientific integrity policies apply to grantees and contractors and similar, so there can be plenty of relevant information here for scientists who interact in any way with federal funding. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is use a few examples pulled from news articles that have come out in recent years, and, and two of them just in the last couple of months, that unfortunately illustrate that even the most comprehensive scientific integrity policy um, is only of limited use if it's not well enforced. And if we can move to the next slide, that would be great. So the, the first area I want to talk about is political interference. Um, in order for any research institute, institution or regulatory entity that relies on scientific research and its decision making to establish and maintain its credibility, the public has to trust that its scientists are not subject to political pressures. And there are regrettably a large number of examples I could choose from that were publicly reported during the Trump administration of censorship and suppression and other kinds of political interference with science. Um, climate science is well known to have been a particular target, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic gave rise to some especially egregious abuses in this area and demonstrated how fast political interference with what should be a nonpartisan scientific activity can damage the credibility even of a gold standard institution. Um, so you see here a headline from a Washington Post article that was just recently published. And that article details how the Trump White House chose to ignore CDC scientists' actual recommendations about things like school reopenings and testing asymptomatic people who were known to have contact with somebody infected uh, with the virus. Um, so these documents arguing in favor of reopening schools um, arguing in favor of uh, not testing uh, asymptomatic people. Um, these were documents that were not authored primarily by CDC scientists, but they nonetheless over the summer appeared on the CDC's website uh, and gave the impression of having come from the CDC, having been authored by CDC scientists. And exactly how that happened isn't yet perfectly clear, I think, but this reporting in the Washington Post did confirm that the orders came from political appointees. So I have a hard time thinking of a clearer example of how political interference with science can have really dire consequences for public health and an agency's credibility. Um, now the good news and a really important thing for any scientist listening to be aware of is that scientific integrity policies at many federal agencies already prohibit this kind of behavior and have for years. Um, but uh, there are a couple of things I think it's worth highlighting here. One is that uh, the CDC of all places happens to be one of the agencies who, whose policy could really use some strengthening in this area. It has some aspirational language about avoiding political influence, but it doesn't go nearly as far as some other policies in explicitly prohibiting it and making it clear what political interference means. Um, next slide, please. So the, the next area that I want to talk about for a minute is a related but distinct topic, which is scientists' right to communicate freely and transparently with the media and with the public about their areas of expertise. So again, an example here that I pulled from a recent article, um, Laura Tenenbaum, uh, worked in NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for over a decade, and at the beginning of the Trump administration, she was the senior science editor for NASA's global climate change website. Um, so her job involved writing blog posts and tweets and Facebook posts and similar um, about climate science and climate issues. Um, and in early 2017, the Washington Post, again, um, published an article highlighting the fact that NASA and you know by by extension she, Laura Tannenbaum was still doing active communication about climate science while other agencies like EPA had essentially shut that down and what Tannenbaum has recently reported here is that that Washington Post article caused NASA management to panic. Um, she describes her manager telling her to stand down on social media. She describes being removed as an administrator from the agency's social media accounts. 
she talks about the fact that all of a sudden new policies at NASA mandated that social media posts be reviewed by managers and by media relations. So communications about climate science became highly vetted and slowed down pretty dramatically, at least for a time. Um, and what she explains is that manager's goal at NASA became to publish just enough about climate information on social media to prevent raising alarms at a decrease, but to ensure that what was published was as bland as possible. Um, and this in the midst of what scientists are telling us is a complete planetary crisis. Um, so again, this is only one of many examples I unfortunately could have chosen from, but it illustrates really vividly how interference with scientists' ability to communicate about their work can really detrimentally impact the public's ability to get information that's very crucial to public health and safety. And it also importantly in, in, illustrates how scientific integrity policies need to apply to and protect not just people who are actively doing scientific research, but also people who work in adjacent areas like science communications. Um, so again, scientists should be aware that just like with freedom of political interference, Freedom of communication is, in fact, already covered by many agencies' scientific integrity policies. Um, but as Laura Tenenbaum's story illustrates, even a good policy isn't much help if employees aren't aware of it or don't think it will be enforced. So NASA's scientific integrity policy has plenty of good language in it about transparency and open communication, but NASA management still decided to gag its public communications about climate science. And to the next slide, please. So the, the third area that I want to highlight, because I, I think it's really important and often a little bit overlooked, is the professional development of an institution's scientists as a fundamental part of its culture of scientific integrity. Um, doing the best possible science really requires attracting and retaining talented scientists and Part of that is ensuring that they are able to be full participants in their professional communities. Um, scientists' ability to publish their work under their professional affiliations, for example, to attend professional conferences and present their work at those conferences, to participate in scientific societies and the peer review process um, are all really important parts of scientific life and, and because of that, of scientific integrity. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things we've seen recently is scientists being prevented from engaging in those professional development activities. Um, so my third example here is from a story about um, just such an instance. Um, William Jolly, uh, a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service, was scheduled to give a presentation at a scientific conference about climate change and its impact on severe fire weather conditions. Um, but when it was time for him to go and he put in his travel request, agency supervisors denied it. And the same thing happened to three other researchers who were scheduled to give presentations about climate change. So agency spokespeople tried to present this as just sort of normal agency procedure um, and a question of funding, but the numbers of federal employees who were approved for travel to that conference were significantly down from previous years, suggesting that that explanation held very little water. So I'm going to return to my sort of theme here, which is that the good news that I, I want scientists listening to be aware of is that many scientific integrity policies already include provisions protecting scientists' ability to engage in professional development activities like this. Um, so the Department of Agriculture, which is the U.S. Forest Service's parent agency, already has language in its policy encouraging the presentation of research findings at professional conferences. Um, but you know, A, that language could be stronger, and B, a lot of other policies um, do have some distance to go on this front. Um, the next slide, please. So I, I want to turn now to talking a little bit about the mechanics of how scientific integrity policies tend to work and, and what kinds of structures and processes they at least often put in place. Um, and 
um, big caveat for, for all of the discussion that's about to follow is that obviously those policies vary. Um, they vary between federal agencies and they certainly vary between agencies and other institutions like universities. But um, what I'm going to try to give is a, a sort of general picture of what they often look like and what you know maybe a plurality of policies tend to contain. Um, so first question, who do they cover? Um, in many instances, these policies provide really broad coverage. So the, a lot of them cover not just all um, career employees uh, whose work involves scientific activities, but also political appointees, contractors, grantees, and volunteers, and similar. Um, slightly different question is who can make a claim under the policy? Um, and surprisingly, a lot of policies don't address this explicitly. Um, and that's particularly true of universities' policies. And, and so what that means is that often there's no explicit requirement that somebody be covered by the policy or affiliated with the institution in question at all in order to file a scientific integrity complaint pursuant to the policy, um, which makes them in some ways you know, a, a potentially really useful and powerful tool, although I think there's definitely some gray area as to um, what would happen if someone not actually covered by the policy tried to pursue a claim under it into a courtroom. Um, it's really important for scientists to be aware that many policies contain really explicit and good provisions protecting the confidentiality of people involved, um, the confidentiality of those who bring complaints, the confidentiality of those who participate in the investigation process. Um, it's also really good to know that it's often possible to make a claim anonymously, although people should be aware that that can make it harder to investigate the claim. Um, so most often, how do you make a claim? You know, what's the actual process for filing one? Um, so most typically, the claim is going to need to go either to um, an appointed scientific integrity officer or official or similar. Many, many agencies have those. Um, uh, in the case of a different un institution like a university, it may be a dean who's been appointed to that type of role. Um, another avenue um, when talking about the federal government is often the Office of the Inspector General. A claim generally needs to be in writing. It generally needs to include at least a basic description of the misconduct that's being alleged and how scientific integrity was impacted. And it's really important for people to be aware that in some cases, these policies do include time limits. Um, they impose specific requirements as to how long after someone becomes aware of a potential violation they have to file a claim. Not all of them have that, but some of them do. So um, it's important important to know um, whether that's the case with the specific policy that applies in your case. Um, so most typically, the scientific integrity officer or official or the equivalent dean, whoever, whoever that is, is going to be responsible for overseeing an investigation. Um, but one thing that's pretty common is that that person will appoint a panel to actually conduct the investigation. And that panel can collect and review um, evidence, including documents, interviewing parties and witnesses who may have information. And then in many cases, one of the things that's really typical is that that panel would then issue a written report of its findings and recommendations. Um, and very often, the, uh, at least the person who has been accused or the people who have been accused of a violation are, are given an opportunity to review that report and and provide comments on it comments on the panel's findings which then uh, are seen by the deciding official um, and generally this all culminates in a written decision by that deciding official on whether there's been a violation um, and what uh, should happen as a result if if one has been found. Um, in many cases, the policies are not very specific about what penalties are appropriate if misconduct is indeed um, found. They they typically leave a huge amount of discretion to that deciding official um, to determine what's appropriate. Um, and that's an area in which I think I think many many policies could actually use a, a great deal of improvement, providing some guidelines for for how uh, violations should be handled. 
Okay, uh, next slide, please. So I, I'll take just a second to mention that um, we at CSLDF have done a pretty extensive review of um, scientific integrity policies at uh, key federal agencies and um, have also uh, have we also have a resource out um, looking at universities and other institutions um, even internationally a little bit this is a, just a, a screenshot from a sort of at a glance guide we put together to the policies at federal agencies um, and and I just wanted to mention it because it's it's you know we we hope we like to think it's a it's a really tremendous resource for scientists who are trying to quickly gauge um, what the policy that applies to them kind of contains its strengths, its weaknesses, how it compares to policies at other institutions. Um, you know, hopefully an easy way to get a, a quick sense of that. So I just wanted to flag that as, as a resource for folks. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to take just a second here, and I, I think Dana's gonna gonna have you know a lot of great information. Um, along these lines as well. Um, but on the scientific integrity violation front, um, a couple of tips and, and do's, do's and don'ts um, for those who uh, find themselves um, in a situation where there is some potential scientific integrity violation. Um, if, if you believe that a violation has occurred, we highly recommend document, document, document. Um, keeping good notes and records um, is incredibly useful, um, although keeping in mind that um, notes and records kept uh, on institutional materials and on institutional time um, may not be so confidential, so I would in fact really recommend, um, you know, doing that uh, maybe even at home. Um, being mindful of deadlines for reporting, as I mentioned, um, it can be really useful to consider consulting trusted colleagues or supervisors to gauge support, um, understand if they see the situation the same way you do. Um, I will mention that it's very important to keep in mind that um, institutional counsel can be a great resource in some circumstances, but it's crucial to remember that they represent the institution and not you. So in any circumstance where your interests diverge in any way from those of the institution, those lawyers are going to represent the, inst the interests of the institution. So it's a great idea um, to consult with us at CSLDF or other terrific attorneys um, like Dana and others at GAP. Um, we at CSLDF offer free confidential consultations to any scientist having questions like this, and I'll put my contact information up at the end, but um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if you are the subject of an accusation, um, don't panic. <laughs> don't ignore it both critically important. Again, documenting the situation, timelines, what's happened can be incredibly useful. Um, and, and again, um, really important, um, particularly in, the, in that circumstance, um, to consider reaching out to us or another attorney. Um, I want to mention really briefly before I turn it over to Dana, um, I've talked about some of the stories of scientists who have experienced these kinds of violations in recent years, and we are um, on the cusp of launching a project in which um, we are, are going to put out a call to scientists who experienced or were aware of um, these kinds of situations, censorship, um, suppression, other, other types of scientific integrity violations and threats to scientific norms, um, and who have not yet told their stories but are interested in doing so, um, to come to us and tell those stories. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to do a little shout out to that. Um, it's coming very, very soon, uh, so stay tuned. And that's going to conclude my portion. I'm I'm now going to turn it over to Dana to, to talk a little bit about the whistleblower angle of things. Um, very quickly, um, yes, I just saw, I forgot to mention, um, we do have um, 
some big chunks of what I've been talking about are, are also in written resources that we have on our website. Um, you can see a couple of, of images of those here. These are available for free downloads, so I highly encourage folks to, to hop onto the website and check those out. And yeah, if you don't mind um, showing people the contact information just for a second, maybe we'll throw it back up at the end, but this is my contact information. Um, and again, we, we do free and confidential consultations, so um, please do not hesitate to reach out if you have a specific question you want to talk about. Thanks so much. All right. That was great. I learned a ton, um, Augusta. Thanks for that. I'm just going to jump in here. And if um, I'm just, I'm, if it's okay, do you want me? I, I'm going to keep my video on if that's okay. Um, maybe it'll be a little bit uh, more dynamic than just the, just the my boring slides. So, um, so I just want to say uh, thank you so much. I'm um, great to be with you. Um, my name is Dana Gold. Um, I work with Government Accountability Project as our Senior Counsel and Director of Education. Um, uh, and so, um, actually, we can go to the next slide. Um, so we have been around for over 40 years and we represent whistleblowers and ensure we protect them and essentially make sure that their disclosures make a difference. Um, we do that by seeking justice if they suffer reprisal or when they're at risk of retaliation for raising concerns. We verify their concerns and make sure that we get them to public interest advocates, to Congress, oversight agencies, um, lawmakers, the press, um, professional associations to try to make a difference with their disclosures. And then we work um, on advancing legal reforms to expand protection for whistleblowers. So we um, we're kind of behind uh, most of the federal laws that exist um, now that protect employees and their rights to raise concerns in the workplace. So I always like to say that we're, we kind of operated at the extreme end of things. Um, uh, it's kind of the, the land of whistleblowing, um, which I'll talk about in just a second when I get to the definition of what a whistleblower is. But um, we're kind of um, uh, part, you know, whistleblowers promote scientific integrity. They, they protect the public interest. Um, their disclosures make a difference by being um, made public and exposing serious wrongdoing. So, um, you know, we're definitely at the other end of extreme um, in terms of when uh, something rises to a level of of a protected disclosure um, uh, of a, of, for a whistleblower, what constitutes whistleblowing. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, I, looking back at um, 2017, when the uh, former administration um, ramped up and when I started working closely with AGU and <laughs> Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, um, I don't know if you recall that um, right after the inauguration is when scientists started being chilled um, right away. Uh, because the National Park Service put up pictures of the crowd sizes at the inauguration. Um, and that's when you saw all the alt agency Twitter feeds start um, and this these uh, rolling out of gag orders on federal scientists and their rights to speak um, and share information. So direct censorship. Um, we have spent the past four years and actually are continuing still, which I'll talk about in a second also, um, of challenging those as illegal gag orders um, that violate whistleblower rights. Um, but they have the, even if you challenge them and we find that we were right, that they were illegal, they still have the intended effect of chilling employees from exercising their whistleblower rights. Um, so it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. And it makes me think about how at the beginning of, of, of that administration, that shot across the bow at scientists really showed that politics were going to influence policy, not science, which of course shows the power of science and scientists um, and, and the role it should normally play in, in, in setting policy. So I'm really excited that we're having this webinar today to talk about what needs to happen. So. While employees were chilled, and hopefully um, with this new project that Augusta just talked about, more will feel safer in this new administration to come out and talk about problems that they witnessed, um, incidents of, of suppression and censorship. Um, but while many employees, I think, kept their heads down 
and we're scared, um, we're afraid of these gag orders and we're afraid of reprisal, um, others stood up and we saw that repeatedly throughout the administration. Um, so we can go ahead a little bit. I'll just run through a couple examples, many of whom you know. Um, Joel Clement um, raised concerns about when he was raising concerns about the effects of, of climate change on Alaska native populations. He was reassigned to collect oil royalties, something he had knew nothing about. Um, uh, uh, filed a, a noisy whistleblower complaint and ultimately um, exited the administration. Um, uh, but he was really one of the kind of first very public whistleblowers uh, of the Trump administration. Um, Kevin Chmielewski, who we don't really think about necessarily as a science whistleblower, um, but he blew the whistle on um, Scott Pruitt, um, then head of the EPA, his gross waste of taxpayer funds and gross mismanagement and abuse of authority. Um, and he was part of the Trump campaign, then came over to be kind of one of the chief of you know staff people uh, under Pruitt. He blew the whistle on waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, and that ultimately led um, to Pruitt's resignation under great investigation and attack. So, um, uh, you know, Stan, in, in some ways that really ended up talking about the power of whistleblowers to stand up for science that where we saw politics really driving um, that agency. Um, Maria Caffrey, who um, Climate Science Legal Defense Fund represents, um, had filed scientific integrity complaints about interference efforts to censor uh, her research and reporting that she had been doing, uh, re research reporting about um, uh, the effects of climate change on uh, coastal national parks. Uh, she, you know, got the, uh, she fought the censorship, but ended up having to file a whistleblower complaint. And then most recently, we all know um, Dr. Rick Bright, who um, uh, raised concerns about the administration's failure to respond uh, to the coronavirus pandemic um, and its uh, touting of bogus uh, therapies. So for COVID, so he uh, ended up being demoted and, uh, you know, sidelined. Um, lauded as a hero, the Biden administration brought him back uh, during the um, uh, uh, pre, uh, you know, pre-inauguration phase as part of the task force. So, um, so whistleblowers really kind of broke through the silence and really stood as emblems of saying, hey, science important. Scientists, we will stand up for science and we're going to expose this effort to politicize science. And so they really they really stood up as human representatives of the need for scientists to speak out and the role science should play in good policy. Um, okay, yeah, so we can switch to who's a whistleblower. Um, so who is a whistleblower? Uh, really quickly, what we're talking about in the legal scheme of things, um, under the Whistleblower Protection Act, which is the large act that protects the majority of federal employees, not intelligence community or postal workers, um, whistleblowers, um, but almost everybody else, uh, a whistleblower is an employee who discloses information that they reasonably believe evidences a violation of law, rule, or regulation, gross mismanagement, gross waste of funds, and abuse of authority, a substantial and specific danger to public health or safety. And for federal employees, they also um, have can raise concerns about censorship that's related to scientific research or analysis, but it has to result in one of those other forms of misconduct. So what's significant here is that this is um, we care about disclosures. What defines a whistleblower, right, is the is the seriousness of the disclosure, um, and the violation of law, rule, or regulation does not include a policy. So you would have to say, if you were if you were making a whistleblower disclosure about scientific censorship, you would need to tie it to the effects of that censorship violating a law, rule, or regulation, or resulting in gross mismanagement, or a gross waste of funds, or an abuse of authority, or resulting in a substantial and specific danger to public health and safety, or having the consequence of that. So it has to rise to this level of public interest concern to be afforded protected activity for a whistleblower to be free from reprisal or to have a right to um, uh, seek justice if they experience reprisal for raising such a concern. So let's switch to the next slide. Um, so what's key to know, um, I think just click the little button, um, is a, it's a reasonable belief standard. You don't have to prove the consequence um, or that something is illegal or that it will result in public health and safety danger. You have to have a reasonable belief that it will, you know, based on an objective standard. 
um, motive doesn't matter. We often think very much about what's the motive of a whistleblower, although I think that has changed dramatically in the past four years. We recognize these are employees that are just speaking up because they witness wrongdoing in the workplace and they're committed civil servants. Um, but motive doesn't matter. It might matter for their own credibility, but it doesn't matter in terms of an element for their right to, to seek justice and to raise a concern. Also, you don't need to go through the chain of command. Um, you could go straight to Congress. You could go straight to the Office of Special Counsel. You could go to a lawmaker. You could go to the press, again, if it meets that standard. Um, that doesn't mean it's smart to do that. Um, so there is value to raising concerns internally first, going through a chain of command to show that you tried. If at the end of the day, um, you want to create the, the strongest case of support for your disclosure, um, but you don't have to. And often um, people sometimes know um, that raising a concern internally won't result in, in um, a, you won't have the effect of, of making a difference. So that's often, or will result in retaliation, which is why sometimes people do go out Side. But 95% of employees raise concerns internally first, overwhelmingly so. Um, so it is, and that is considered protected whistleblowing. It is not just when you go outside to the press. Those are not just whistleblowers. Most have raised concerns internally first, and that is when protected activity and the right to be do so free from reprisal starts. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, Unprotected disclosures, um, this is important to know. Um, you can't object, you can't just have a policy um, disagreement. You can't just object to a policy. That's not um, considered a protected whistleblowing disclosure. But you can be concerned about the effects or consequences of a policy. So if you are trying to assert um, a whistleblower claim, framing it as your concern is about the consequences or dangerous effects of a policy, um, that would be considered protected activity. Um, also, disclosures are not protected if they're um, permitted, uh, uh, prohibited by statute, like HIPAA, Privacy Act violations, trademark violations, or if they're um, by executive order for national security, if it's classified information. Okay, let's switch to the next slide. Okay, so these are under, again, this is under the Whistleblower Protection Act that protects federal employees, although this is an, a law that has informed um, many of the other laws that exist out there that protect whistleblowers. Um, these are considered the kinds of forms of retaliation that would be prohibited um, uh, to take against an employee for exercising, for whistleblowing, for, for disclosing information um, that rises to those different levels of wrongdoing that I described earlier. Um, and they it can be, um, you know, usually they take the form of personnel actions, but they're, you know, creative. You can see you can have a, an appointment um, or the lack thereof or being appointed differently. So basically some change into the terms of conditions of your employment largely is what it, um, uh, what the what the form it takes um, or the threat of, of harm, uh, the threat that these personnel actions could be taken. Those also are illegal. Um, one other thing that's really important to remember, which refers back to what I was talking about in the beginning, were the gag orders are non-disclosure agreements that do not explicitly include an exception for whistleblower rights um, are facially illegal. So if, if you receive a gag order that does not say your whistleblower rights supersede any non, this non-disclosure agreement or this gag agree or this directive to not talk to the press, if, if that directive does not contain very explicit magic statutory language that your whistleblower rights supersede the gag order, it's not enforceable um, in itself. Plus, you, of course, also have your whistleblower rights to make disclosures. Again, the problem is these gag orders have an inherent chilling effect, even if they're illegal. Um, and so uh, it's certainly sending the message uh, um, instrumentally to whistleblowers or potential employees not to talk. But they are illegal if they don't reiterate an employee's rights to exercise um, their statutory occupational speech rights. OK, let's go on. And so these are the kinds of, um, uh, just a summary essentially, of the kinds of things that employees, federal employees can't be gagged or disciplined for. Making a disclosure to managers, to an IG, to the Office of Special Counsel, communicating with Congress, to the media or a watchdog organization, that has been deemed also to constitute protected activity. Um, again, remember the protected disclosure has to rise to those levels of wrongdoing that I articulated before. Um, 
You can file a complaint or a grievance related to the disclosure or the repri reprisal. You can testify as a witness um, or seeking a whistleblower, uh, uh, assisting a whistleblower seeking a remedy. Um, you can also refuse to obey an order that would that would essentially be illegal. Um, uh, but it's a much higher risk to do that. The law is a little bit unsettled there. So the burden would fall on the employee um, to show that the law was illegal. So it's, a, it's definitely for all of these. Um, the big takeaway is talk to an attorney <laughs> as early as you can because um, it's a complicated thicket, um, at, which actually brings us to our next slide. And I'll just go through these really quickly so we can have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, whistleblower law is complicated. So even though I was just talking about the Whistleblower Protection Act, which is the primary law that protects federal employees um, and informs again many of the other laws um, it's a it's a they are like 60 plus laws just federal laws um, that, that cover have different whistleblower protection provisions in them or that protect different forms of occupational speech um, or speech of wrongdoing for your rights to report wrongdoing um, they are largely anti-retaliation schemes which is why um, you know, we talked about an employee is usually the person that is protected and has the right to make the disclosure. And that is because employees are usually in the best position to witness misconduct, to enforce compliance with the law. And they're also the most vulnerable to retaliation. Um, but not all of them require you to be an employee is most. Um, some have bounty provisions where you can get a financial award for reporting. Most don't. Um, and that still doesn't stop whistleblowers or employees from raising concerns. It's usually they're not, nobody's doing it for the money. You should buy a lottery ticket. Um, most are doing it because they see something wrong in the workplace and they can't stay silent. They just can't live with themselves if they stay silent. Um, so the Whistleblower Protection Act, again, um, is the primary law for federal employees. Their rights are only enforced through the Office of Special Counsel and by appeal to the Merit Systems Protection Board. Um, this is a huge problem, which I'll talk about in a second for about the reform that is desperately needed to fully protect federal employees. They need their rights strengthened because the Merit Systems Protection Board, which is where employees go to appeal um, for uh, their uh, retaliation rights, has uh, is not uh, does not have full membership. There's no board, essentially. And so there's a backlog of 3,000 cases, and there is no right for employees to remove uh, to federal court to have a, a right for an independent right of action outside of this system. So it's, um, it's, it's a huge problem uh, for federal employees in terms of not having real rights um, with a remedy because of the broken um, administrative system uh, that they're locked into currently. Um, so, uh, so, so that is that is that is a, that is a huge problem. Uh, but you can make disclosures as well as um, so you can disclose problems that you see to the Office of Special Counsel, even if without suffering retaliation, and they will be in, they have to investigate that, and the employee has a right to review um, the findings. They also can file retaliation claims with the Office of Special Counsel. So um, that's a, it's a complicated system and there's a resource we have that can help navigate that. Um, but because it's just one of many laws, I didn't wanna go deep into the process for that. Um, let's quickly go ahead. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act has provisions for contractors, federal contractors and grantees. Um, so that may apply to a bunch of you. So it's the same standard that applies for federal employees in terms of what is pr considered protected activity. An employee, a contractor or a grantee can disclose a violation of law, rule or regulation, gross mismanagement, gross waste of funds, abuse of authority or a substantial and specific danger to public health and safety. But censorship is not one of the enumerated forms of a protected disclosure under the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, disclosures, there are enumerated entities to whom an employee can make a disclosure to Congress, an Office of Inspector General, the Government um, Accountability Office, the GAO, Department of Justice or other law enforcement agency, the grant manager um, within the federal agency or within the company or the university. Um, so the grant, you know, so whoever has the grantee or the grant contract official, the management. Um, so there are lots of folks you can make a, a disclosure to. Um, they do look to the Whistleblower Protection Act to interpret the National Defense Authorization Act, which has held the disclosures to the press or watchdog organizations are protected. Um, but um, 
to be safe, we always counsel that focusing on these enumerated entities, um, at least uh, from the degree and the channel, the chain of disclosure is the safest bet. Um, complaints are filed with the Agency Office of Inspector General, and these can be removed to federal district court for a jury trial. So contractors and grantees have much better rights and opportunities for enforcement than federal employees. So this is a, this is a, um, it's actually a great helpful new law. Um, it's been around for about eight years now. So let's um, quickly go on. Um, so the patchwork continues. You probably have heard about the False Claims Act. That's for reporting fraud on the government. It's not just about money, but it could be, for instance, failure to record illegal discharges of hazardous waste or defective products, failure to perform required testing. Um, so there are lots of different forms fraud can take as long as it's material. Um, and that this is a bounty law. So uh, there are both anti-retaliation provisions, but also you can make a disclosure and get up to um, a third of the amount recovered um, uh, if the Department of Justice, you know, or if, if there's recovery. So uh, this is filed with the Department of Justice and is filed under seal. Um, there are also employee protection provisions that are embedded in many environmental safety and financial regulations. Um, so under the Energy Organization Act, RICRA, um, uh, CERCLA, Toxic Substance Tosca, um, a bunch of different laws have employee protection provisions in them that basically, if you make disclosures about um, uh, the, in furtherance of the purpose of the acts or violations of those acts, those will be considered protected. Um, they go through a different system through the Department of Labor. Many, it's a patchwork um, of protections. Again, some you can have an independent right of action um, to for a jury trial to remove. Some you have to go through the Department of Labor system, um, through the administrative system for a remedy. We're working on a consolidated a consolidation act um, where uh, uh, all of these um, these laws would be harmonized uh, to meet best practice standards um, so they wouldn't be this crazy patchwork with different statute limitations and remedies and um, uh, and processes so um, so that's a, a an aspiration and that can apply to corporate employees and some federal employees have rights under different um, for some of some of these different acts and then there are state laws um, so it can depend on if you're a public um, employee uh, in a state sometimes there are laws that are on statute that cover everybody sometimes there's the common law provision not all um, for wrongful discharge um, there are state false claims act so it really matters um, um, to find legal advice early because it really is this um, analysis of what you blow the whistle on or what kind of employee you are, what retaliation you suffered, um, uh, you know, when you suffered it, uh, where you are that can matter in terms of whether what your rights are, how to best exercise them, um, uh, and how to minimize risk and then seek justice. Um, so let's quickly move on. Um, so I just want to talk really quickly about needed reform. Um, the Scientific Integrity Act is now in committee. It was introduced last term, um, but it has now been in, reintroduced by um, Representative Tonko. Um, so it's sitting in committee right now. But this would be it's just so important. It would basically make all the policies that Augusta talked about, um, it would put them into law. It would make them mandatory and with certain standards that would then be enforceable. Um, the, the value also of the Scientific Integrity Act, which unfortunately at this point does not contain um, as drafted a whistleblower, an, an independent right of action for whistleblower protection, but, but because it would be a law that would be codified, it could then be um, a a, a part of what a protected disclosure could be. So a federal employee could enforce it under the Whistleblower Protection Act if they alleged a violation of the Scientific Integrity Act. So that's why it's so important that it gets passed. But then on top of that, we need to pass the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act, which would fix all of those problems I was talking about that currently exist with the Whistleblower Protection Act by giving employees a right to remove so they could have a jury trial. It would also prohibit retaliatory investigations, which we have seen to be a common retaliatory tool used against whistleblowers that isn't considered a prohibited personnel practice right now. It would also ideally offer interim relief if an employee can show that they would likely prevail at trial um, at a hearing. Um, really important because some of these cases can take forever. Um, and it's um, it's a horrible experience, frankly, to be a whistleblower um, seeking justice. So. Um, 
And then finally, I would say for reform, uh, rights training, valorization of whistleblowers, all of these things are so important for rights training for employees and for managers to know that they can't gag their employees. Um, and that they can't retaliate against them for raising concerns, for employees to know that they can raise concerns, that they cannot be gagged from speaking um, and exercising their whistleblower rights, how to navigate those, um, how, how to navigate these complicated systems. All of those are so important for normalizing the act of speaking out in defense of science. Um, okay, so let's quickly go on. Almost done here. So just quick best practices piling on from Augusta. Um, talk again, where we represent people pro bono. Um, we can always give advice uh, for free if we can't represent you. Um, uh, we, we can't represent most people, but we can certainly give advice and guidance and great referrals. Um, uh, but it's really important to talk to a lawyer as early as you can in the process because um, exercising your rights um, and minimize your risks is, is super important. And it is possible. It is possible to, to blow the whistle in a way that actually um, mitigates risks, surround people and support support um, and focuses on the message and not the messenger. Um, so, uh, but getting help early and, and keeping your options open uh, by talking to an experienced lawyer who can try to provide you that support is super important. Document, um, document, document. It is super important um, to make a note to the record, keep uh, times, dates, what happened, when, really, really valuable. Um, secure and protect evidence. Don't remove it if it's prohibited. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, raise the issue within the agency's chain of command. So even though you don't have to, it's about being constructive and it's about creating a record that you are trying to exercise, be a good civil servant or a good worker, trying to give the opportunity to management to cure. Um, I understand that sometimes that's not possible, um, but it does, it creates this record and it, and it also helps you shore up the knowledge element that the employer needs to know that you they that you are blowing the whistle um, if they if they do end up engaging in retaliation if that's what um, happens because it can be hard if you raise the um, an issue anonymously um, often employers can still figure out who is raising the concern so we have lots of advice about raising concerns anonymously um, but it's often very possible to figure out who is the person raising concern but if you do it anonymously it can be harder to show that the employer did know who it was raising the concern because they would have plausible deniability. Okay, and we're just about done. Um, yeah, check with colleagues to get support. Um, uh, you know, see who's going to have your back, potentially as witnesses, um, if everything if everything goes to an investigative stage. Um, you talk to family; it can be a life changing decision to blow the whistle. And then anonymity. Um, we have a whole book about that. <laughs> um, about how um, it, it can be, pop, it, it's it's hard. Um, be be wary of someone promises that they can maintain your anonymity. Um, and there are certain advantages of not being anonymous, but there are also ways to kind of do things in ways that are quiet that don't make you the center of um, of attention to make a change. Um, okay, and I think. Um, I'll just end with the resources. Uh, actually, yesterday we released the second edition of Truth Telling in Government, a guide to whistleblowing for federal employees, contractors, and grantees. Um, this has uh, the most current information, although it's similar to what is in our Speaking Up for Science guide. So either one will um, offer you uh, great information about your options, where to make a disclosure, how to exercise your rights, tips for survival tips. Um, it's free to download. Um, at our website so um uh definitely check that out um so um i that's that's all for me except for the fact that i just think that um uh scientists um science uh, we're on we're on a positive trajectory um is the new administration but and i think never before have we seen science be so under attack but also more um, understood as essential for making sound policy, protecting public health and safety. Um, I think, uh, but we cannot be complacent. So pushing for this legislation, uh, supporting whistleblowers when they speak up, exercising scientific integrity policies, all of these are super important for making sure that we restore science to, science to its proper role um, in setting policy. So thanks. And we have some questions that came in. I don't know if we want to take other questions from the audience or um, go over some of the ones that were written in, but we'd be happy to take some of those. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Augusta and 
Dana for sharing all that great information, those great resources. Um, we are gonna go ahead and answer the questions that were sent in with the registration. So um, Dana and Augusta, if you wanna, wanna roll through some of those. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but please, if anybody um, has them as they're coming up, um, I think we had some good coverage of a broad range of topics that um, uh, through some of the pre-submitted questions, but. Yeah, Augusta, do you want me to take the ones that, um that I could answer and then, okay, so I'll just go through. So one was, um, does Government Accountability Project um, represent professionals where there's not a high likelihood of recovering fees via key TAM laws, which are the False Claims Act um, cases, the fraud cases with the bounty that um, I had mentioned earlier, um, all the time. We That's usually basically who we represent, our whistleblowers who are not blowing the whistle on fraud, but are blowing the whistle on big public health and safety problems or environmental issues and dangers or immigration abuses. So those are not fraud-based cases. So yes, we represent them. Um, I would say predominantly. Um, uh, I, there's what, a great question about to what authoritative source can a scientific whistleblower appeal to support their claim? And I wasn't sure if that was about, if that is, so if someone is, um, if that person is actually watching, it'd be great to have uh, clarity about that question. Um, so I wasn't sure if that meant, you know, to whom do I go to file a claim? But I think it actually meant like, where do I get support to verify my claim? And I thought that was a, such a really interesting question because um, so often we've seen with whistleblowers, one of the things that we do to strengthen their disclosures and also to insulate them from reprisal and to put pressure on making sure that lawmakers um, or the agency that's engaged with the wrongdoing addresses it is to get support from like professional associations or other experts to verify Verify and speak, you know, and validate a whistleblower's disclosures. Um, I know when we represented Aldrich Saucier, who was a Star Wars whistleblower. Um, he was a physicist. who was like the Star Wars program is just completely not going to work. Um, but he was he he wasn't a um, great public speaker or good at explaining in a layperson way, like you know, kind of what the disclosure was about. And so we had all these Nobel scientists basically reviewing his disclosures and speaking essentially on his behalf. Same thing with our immigration whistleblowers, who are doctors who raised concerns concerns about harms to children in detention, um, you know, they've been surrounded in support from professional associations who have come out um, saying that, yes, that is exactly what the research said, that um, detention causes harm to children. So I thought that was a great question. Um, I mentioned the status of the MSPB appeals court. Great question. I wish I had a better answer for you, which would be that it was functional and there was no backlog, but there is. Um, and then I think there was a great question, what more should be done legislatively and legally to protect against retaliation against whistleblowers? Um, and I think that um, part of it is, are those reforms that we just talked about um, that need to happen. We need stronger laws to make um, it easier to blow the whistle without so much risk, to make their consequences for managers when they engage in retaliation. I think more training really matters. Um, and you know, I think this, you know, kind of Me Too movement for whistleblowers where we validate their stories, right? We we believe the whistleblower and we um, question the misconduct, right? And the wrongdoer, it's kind of shifting the burden, the cultural burden of presumption that we normalize the right to raise concerns and speak up against misconduct in the in the workplace um, actually will go a long way um, to protecting whistleblowers actually from retaliation um, uh, because it won't be culturally um, uh, acceptable. So those are those are some questions that, that I could take. So Augusta, I don't know if you wanna take some others. Sure. Yeah, and I, I know we're running close to our time, but um, Caitlin, if you if you feel like there's a, a minute, um, that we got a couple questions that, to me, almost all go together. So I'm I'm going to a little bit address them that way. Um, we got we got uh, one which is would it be a scientific integrity violation if an agency knowingly published misleading or incomplete information in an environmental impact statement? And for those who, who I, I'm guessing most people probably do, but, I, but for those who don't know, environmental impact statement is part of the um, process under uh, NEPA, um, one of the really important um, federal environmental statutes that requires an agency to do an environmental review and a review of the environmental impact of any major action it's going to take or approve. So any, you know, in particular, any kind of um, 
infrastructure project or thing like that that may have an environmental impact needs to go through this environmental impact statement um, process. Um, and then there are a couple of questions about <laughs> that kind of, in my mind, go with that a little bit about how can researchers influence that influence policy, um, particularly with respect to environmental improvement. And to me, the first question almost answers the second. Um, so in with respect to the question about would it be a scientific integrity violation to put misleading or inaccurate information or incomplete information in an environmental impact statement, my answer to that is a wholehearted yes. Yes, it would. Almost every single, maybe every single environment, uh, scientific integrity policy I've ever seen has a good bit of language, multiple provisions talking about the importance of accurate scientific information um, and that being the bedrock of scientific integrity and of, of agencies and other institutions um, conducting and using sound science so including misleading or inaccurate information in a document like a sign uh, an environmental impact statement absolutely um, would constitute a violation of those policies and it's a perfect example of a place where all kinds of scientists and um, one of the questions is about you know those who are more in the life sciences botany biology um how can those scientists play an important role in policy well things like environmental impact statements have ever a ton to do um, with biology with ecosystem biology ecology um things like that so there is space for scientists in all kinds of fields to play a really important role in making sure that agency processes um, like the issuing of environmental impact statements like the issuing of all other kinds of rules and regulations that affect the environment that affect human health contain complete and accurate information. Um, so that's why this is such an important conversation because you know these tools, um, we hope this information and these tools will help scientists to understand that there is in fact a, a structure available to help you stand up and make sure that, um, that, that those kinds of processes do get based on the best available science. Um, I'll add to that too, Augusta. So um, I think, sort of in uh, tying in all three of those questions. So in addition to um, making yourself a resource to your legislators, either a local level or a federal level, um, you can also uh, comment on proposed regulations. So yeah. um, environmental impact statements are a huge part of that, that the public is available to comment on them. So. Um, actually used to do this review for the federal government. So um, if you are an expert in any of this kind of science, please, please, please submit that data, submit that information. Um, we're coming out at AG with a public comment toolkit um, in the next couple of weeks to give you some tips for how to submit those comments, what finding some of those regulations look like. Um, but that's a really great way to um, involve yourself as a scientist in all different kinds of science in um, in the policy making process. Absolutely. So um, we are at an hour now. Um, I apologize for any of the questions that we didn't get to, but I can. Um, uh, if if these are still questions that you have, you can email um, my self. My email is uh, cbergstrom at agu.org. Um, Augusta or Dana with any of these questions. So thank you so much um, to Augusta and, and Dana for joining us today. And thank you all for sticking around for the questions. Thanks so thank much. You.